Okay, she is. Let's let's get started. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Goodman, a member of the USTA Middle States Leadership Development Committee. And this is the first iteration of our leadership series created by our committee under the leadership of Jim Flesh. The idea here is to produce interesting and engaging conversations with leaders from around our section, and in cases like today, from beyond our section. We hope these sessions are a little more casual than some of the other meetings you likely take part in every day, while offering some thought-provoking discussion and giving you a bit of an inside look at the many different personalities and stories in our sport. Now, you all know Katrina. She was the first African-American to lead the USTA, the first two-term chairman and president of the organization, and the first player to hold that honor. Katrina attended Northwestern University and went on to win 20 career doubles titles, reaching the quarters or better at all four Grand Slam events. And she's the executive director of the Harlem Junior Tennis and Education Foundation. Recently, she wrote a book titled Own the Arena, Getting Ahead, Making a Difference, and Succeeding as the Only One. Katrina, welcome. Thanks, David. So, I'm excited to be here. And, and you know, you're, you're among friends. I know you've been doing a lot of these recently with the book. And um, this, is, this may be one of the few audiences where it's, it's all your tennis family. So I hope you feel at home. No, I'm excited. I'm thrilled. Thank you. So what motivated you, a very busy person, to write a book? I was motivated by others. I never had a desire to ever want to write a book. Um, you know, I'm a fairly private person when it comes to what I do outside of the public eye. But I was encouraged by many over the years to say that I needed, that I should write a book, that I needed to write a book to really share my story because it is unique uh, and that it is inspiring and it has inspired many. So once I started uh, looking at it from that angle and, and looking at it more of a leadership book, then I was, uh, I really got excited about going down the path that I did. So for those who haven't read it yet, and I suggest that the folks do read it, explain what you mean by own the arena. So funny story. Um, the title that I was going to uh, have it was own the room because everyone always said, cat, no matter where you go, you own the room. And, and it was really, you know, the impetus or really the, the direction behind the book of getting ahead, making a difference and succeeding as the only one. For me, that only one was either being the only woman in a room or the only black person in the room, particularly in meeting rooms. And, and so that's where it came from. But it was the publisher that decided that I was much bigger than a room, that I was more of an arena. And for me, the definition of that arena can be wherever you are. Your space is your arena and it's how you uh, take ownership of that space. So you, you just mentioned that uh, at, at sometimes you, found, you find yourself as the, whether it's the only woman, the only black woman, or the only person of color in the room. And that's been, for you, at, including at the highest levels of the sport. It reminds me of when Billy Ray Jackson, who you may know, and I, we played in the Sunday Doubles League at the Armory in Harlem back in the 90s. I was the only white guy, and it was intimidating. And that's one example for me. You can cite several examples over the years. What's your approach in a situation like that? And, and how do you own the arena in that case? Well, you know, it's very interesting. Thanks for sharing that story because we have all been the only one of something somewhere. And it's important for that individual to understand how they feel in that moment. You know, what are they thinking? What are their surroundings? Um, or if they walk in and, and think nothing of it. I mean, too often, I'm, I'm used to being in that position. so. You know, and today I don't think anything about it, um, but I recognize it and it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's can be challenging. But I think that's why for me, particularly when I was at the head of, of the USTA, I had to make sure that everywhere I went that I was that, you know, I was on time that, you know, I crossed my T's and dotted my I's and made sure that I represented not only myself in the USTA, but I was representing an entire culture. So I would not use the word intimidated for me, because no one or nothing intimidates me. Um, but it is a sense of, of awareness, if you will. And I remember many years ago when I first joined the board of, of the USTA, 
and I was talking about diversity and inclusion and, and, and I turned the tables on the crowd to said, you know, why don't you put yourself in a position at an event, go to an event where no one looks like you and find out how you respond. Because too often for, for me or people of color, we're always blamed that when we go to these events, we always find ourselves gravitating to a pocket of people that look like us, whether it's another woman or what, another person of color, whatever that is. And yeah, it's of course, because that's where we're at ease and we wanna introduce ourselves because it doesn't mean we know them, but we wanna introduce ourselves or there's a certain comfort level. And it's the same thing that you, David, would do in another room. Um, you may find your, your white counterpart or another male, if you're in a room with all women, you're gonna go say hello to them first before you start to navigate the room. And I think it's important right. that all of us put ourselves in those situations um, from time to time to truly understand um, what being that only one feels like. Right, right. So, and we're gonna talk a lot about leadership, obviously, and, and I love the way you compared leadership to playing tennis, where in a match, tennis players are actually playing with each other. Dancing with a singular ball is how you put it in the book, which I think is poetic. Talk more about that from a leadership standpoint, that relation to, to playing tennis. Yeah, I mean, when you're, when we all know as tennis players, when we're on the court, we're our own leader because we are, we are, you know, individuals. You may be playing doubles, but you are responsible for your own actions, for your own thoughts, for your own tactics and your strategies. And yes, you are reacting a lot to what's being hit your way as far as which way you move left or right. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing as when you're in a leader, leadership position. You know, you're responsible for your own tactics, your own strategy and the direction and the pathway that you choose, but you have to always be ready for whatever's coming left and whatever's coming right. But when you have a singular focus on what your vision is, then you have to do what it takes to accomplish that. So whether it's winning the tennis match or, or getting your thought passed through or, or something passed in the boardroom, that's the direction that you go. So they, to me, they go hand in hand. So speaking of the boardroom, and I'm not going to use the word intimidating, um, uh, but I'm going to use the word daunting. How daunting was it to become president of the USTA in a, an organization that doesn't have a stellar history of embracing being different? And what was your leadership game plan going in? You know, I don't want to say it was daunting. I think because I've been around for a while, I mean, I've been on the board for many years and, and particularly in that space, in that room, in that arena, it was diverse. So whether it was other women, other people of color, you know, we had a very diverse board and that was something that I really admired about the USTA you know, for the last 15, 20 years or so when they really mm -hmm. made a conscious effort of doing that. So I never felt like I was alone in that space. However, when, you know, 2015 rolled around and I knew that I was the first person of color, first black person in 135 year history of the, of the organization, that in itself was daunting, but it was also disappointing and it was shameful that it took that long for us to have someone that looked like me as a leader. So I took full advantage of that opportunity to really try to move the agenda forward on our diversity and inclusion issues. Well, if you recall, I focus on a Hispanic initiative, not to take away from our other diverse backgrounds, but this was a group of people or our Latinx communities that we really needed to embrace and bring into our sport. As we look 50 years from now, who the majority of this country um, will look like. And, and we were already excelling, uh, excelling and succeeding on the African-American front with our, you know, our players constantly moving up and, and winning, particularly on the women's side. Yeah. And, but even more so, it, just at the grassroots level from what the NJTLs had accomplished, et cetera. Um, our Asian Americans, we were having success with a lot of our juniors in, in our junior events. And so it wasn't that we were taken away from them. It was just that I wanted to focus on this particular group of people to make sure that we didn't miss the boat when we're you know, looking ahead 50 years from now, which we probably won't be here, um, but to, in hope that there's a little more, a lot more balance in, right. in sport. 
So you've been you've been known for being a very successful collaborator. Talk about the importance of collaboration and and your success collaborating to get things done as a leader during your tenure. Well, I don't think anyone can get anything done if they're not collaborating with their stakeholders. And so, you know, with, within the USTA, of course, we're very unique with our, our sections, section leadership with the president's delegates and executive directors and, and trying to really pull together and come together for the common good of the sport. And so I really did try to make it a point to communicate often, particularly with my fellow presidents of the sections, mm -hmm. keep them abreast of things that I was thinking or directions that I wanted to go or just to get feedback from them. Because too often we get in the seat that I was in and there, there's no communication or we're not even asking for feedback. So I wanted to know how it was doing. You know, I, I often ask people, how do you think I'm doing? How do you think we're doing? You know, how can I, you know, help you better, et cetera, because we collectively have to come together to grow the sport. It's not just one person. It's not one office. It's not one building. It's not one, one city. Right. It's everybody together. And so that's why it was important, not only with the USCA constituencies, but also all of our other partners that we deal with, with our parks and recs, um, you know, tennis on campus, our college and universities, et cetera, to make sure that we're all striving for the same goal of success. Talk about your uh, your ABCs. I thought that was really interesting. Your your leadership style and your philosophy of leadership. Yeah, I mean, from day one, I mean, I, I look at I, I chose the ABCs because I think it's something that it's just simple that you can that you can always rely and 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 remember. And we were an organization that we needed to be more accountable for what we were doing. We needed to be more accessible in, in how we were welcoming people to our sport. We needed to change our behavior from what it was in the past to a, a new bold direction going forward of being more inclusive and, and really stepping outside of our comfort zone and outside of the box to be a little more innovative. And, and we needed to communicate with each other to make sure that we could succeed in these areas. And then of course, collaborate with what we just touched on. So, so for those, uh, for those keeping score, there were a bunch of A's and, and B's and C's in there, namely uh, accountability, behavior, and communication, among others. But um, uh, it's it was really interesting to read about that. Um, you also mentioned that you do, you you have your own personal board of directors. How does this group help you, and how often do you call on them? Yeah, so my personal board of directors are, are friends and colleagues that have uh, very diverse backgrounds and expertise in, in areas. Um, people that I could actually lean on or reach out to and have a discussion outside of the workplace. Because I think too often when we're in our, in our work, workspace, workplace, we're hearing what people want us to hear and not maybe what it is that we should be hearing. And so before I had to make the big decisions on different things, I would lean on um, my you know, investment expert friend or my accounting expert friend or my lawyer expert friend or my creative expert friend, whatever it was to just kind of run ideas by them and, and, and hear a different tone, a different voice um, to help me either to either reassure me that I'm making the right decision or for someone to say, you know, I don't have any skin in the game, but you might want to you might want to rethink this, or you might want right. to try looking at something different. And I think that's important that everyone has that, and it's very different. You know, I talk about the village, who's your mostly your family and, and your friends, and those are the people that tell you everything you want to hear. Um, and even your network can be different. Your network or, or colleagues that you work with um, that you can definitely have you have like minds and, and interests that you can have in depth conversations but they're not really going to be give you what you need from your personal board. Right. And on that same token, uh, you have an executive coach, right? How, how has, how has your coach helped you? And, and do you recommend a coach for all aspiring and, and existing leaders? Yeah, she's been amazing. I, I continue to speak to her uh, on occasion. I knew when I came into the role of uh, the president, CEO and chairman at the time, um, that that was a new arena for me. It was a new territory and, and all eyes were going to be on me. So I wanted to make sure that I understood 
uh, the lingo and the genre of, of an executive field to be able to understand different terminologies that I might not have known because I didn't come from that space. Right. And, and to really understand um, how to read personalities better in the workspace and understand my own personality better as to how I would be able to communicate. Um, and there's so many other elements and levels that are involved, but it was something that I felt was imperative so that no one could ever say that, well, <clears throat> she didn't have the background, she didn't have the experience, she didn't know what she was doing. Um, but, you know, behind the scenes, I was, I definitely knew what I was doing and, <laughs> and I was learning every step of the way. And I, and I got, the, I got the executive coach before I became the president. This was when I was right. the first vice president. And then, you know, and then I only have touch up um, calls here and there now. And, and it's a great point, I think, because it's at, at whatever level uh, you can always use coaching. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And, and you mentioned when you're talking about when you took over the position, you were president, chairman, and CEO. And I think for the benefit of this group, a, a, a USTA group, they, they may not know the whole story and what happened and how that role changed um, with, with your guidance, really. Can you talk about that and how that CEO role went away? Yeah, I mean, we, we as long as I can remember, that was the title of the president, it was the president, chairman, and CEO of the organization. And, and not to take away from my predecessors, because many of the people that uh, many of my predecessors were CEOs in their own companies and businesses before they became the president of the USTA. And they brought that level, level of expertise. But it was also many, many years ago where we truly were a volunteer organization with, with I don't want to say an average staff, but a, a less professional or less experienced right. staff than what we have today. But over time, as we built and, and became a much stronger um, more successful organization and our bank account became bigger and, and better. So did the level of expertise from our staff. And, and so coming in as a volunteer with that title for two years and every two years, the CEO is changing, can be very confusing to the business world and our partners who want to be sponsors, et cetera. And we're volunteers. I'm not doing the day-to-day. -day. I'm not doing the hiring and the firing of, of, of our senior staff, et cetera. It was the COO executive director that right. really was doing that day-to-day -day work. And so I wanted to have clarity for the organization uh, going forward as to who is really the, you know, running the, the organization. We as chairman and president, they report to us. We kind of had the final say and, and word or not kind of, but we do because they have to get guidance from us. They report to us um, and the board, us meaning the chair and president, as well as the board. So as far as the, the roles and responsibilities, it didn't change from right. the executive director just because they got the CEO title from the chair president and the board. But also, you know, it was also during a time where we were borrowing hundreds of millions of dollars from these banking institutions and they wanted the signature of the CEO on there. Right. And our CFO had to explain, well, no, that's not how we work. Um, and so it was through that guidance that I developed a governance task force um, to really first explore, uh, to explore the term expanding from two years to three years for that role because you can't get a lot done in two years, um, as well as looking at other governor's issues and the CEO title was one of them. And so the CEO title was approved to transfer to the executive director at the time, um, CEO executive director, and then retain the chairman president title for, for the volunteer position. And, um, and then the three years was turned down, but I ended up getting four years. So <laughs> I'm glad it wasn't three years because I would have made it five years and I'm not sure that would have been, would have been the right decision at that time. Right. So I mentioned the Harlem earlier, and I know that your first role as an organizational leader was as the executive director of the Harlem Junior Tennis and Education Foundation. There may be many people watching and listening today who have yet to ascend to a leadership role, but who probably will at some point. What advice do you have for these first time leaders? I think the important, the important element is to understand 
what you're going into. Do your research, be prepared. You know, don't just walk into the door blindly and think you can pick it up on the fly because you can't. So there's a lot of background research that needs to be done for you to understand and develop your own thoughts as to how you see this organization growing or the direction that you want it to go in. And then understand who your stakeholders are and be able to have open conversations with them and communicate. And, and when you're going into an organization like an NJTL, well, it's your board of directors that you really need to, to get to know and, and, and share your vision with, um, not just in a group setting, but one-on-one -on -one to see how everyone really feels and what their passion is as to why they're involved in the organization. Yeah. But you know, then you have to be able to understand who your community leaders are and all the other stakeholders that are surrounding programs. But no matter what business it is that you're going in, you have to do that no matter the highest level of being an executive director or a CEO of a business, that research and background work has to be done in order to equip you with the knowledge that you need to go in and make sound decisions right from the start. Right, you can't own the arena without being prepared, right? Exactly. <laughs> so you have a quote in, that starts one of the chapters of the book from Venus Williams and, and it, says, uh, it says, some people say I have attitude but I think you have to. You have to believe in yourself when no one else does. That makes you a winner right there. That was from Venus. Now, Katrina, you have attitude. Um, how does attitude help you? And, and when does it come into play the most? Well, I'm going to take that as a compliment. Yes, that's how it was meant. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think mine really comes from being that competitive tennis player of, of not of not letting someone in your space. Um, you know, we as competitors, we really have to be on our toes at all times and, and, and not let our guard down, if you will. And I was once, I was once approached, I was once told that I was not approachable. And, and I'm like, well, has that person tried to approach me? And they said, no. I said, so how do they know if I'm approachable or not? And, and I think it was more of the demeanor and, you know, of how I carry myself and I probably have softened up a little bit, the further away, further away, away I get from, from competing on the court, but it is, it is an edge that you have to have to be a leader and, and to be able to kind of, you know, wipe off, you know, the, the negativity that may be surrounding you, um, to be able to forge ahead and stay focused. So that attitude is, is the level of confidence that you have to have. If I don't have an attitude of confidence then, and an attitude of weakness, then I'm not going to succeed. Right, and we want our leaders to have that attitude of confidence and, and, and that attitude of strength. There's, there's no doubt it gives, it gives us that confidence and strength as well. Yes, and it is um, confidence, not arrogance. And, uh, and I think a lot of people, right try to put that, that, uh, that description of confidence of being arrogant and it's not. You, you made a point in the book that made me think as, as a father with two daughters, it, um, I read it a couple of times. You said that women tend to hold themselves back more than they should. You cited the fact that women don't apply for jobs unless they meet hundred percent of the requirements. While often men have the swagger to go for it, whether they're qualified or not. What's your advice to those women or my daughters who are tentative in certain situations? You gotta be confident. You have to know that you can do anything uh, if you put your mind to it. I mean, it, we don't know everything and we have to learn along the way. And I think that is, I mean, that, that's a true statement that I put, I should have probably put some uh, documentation behind it. But, you know, as women, we'll know four out of, you know, we'll feel four, out of five slots and say that we're not qualified. Whereas my, my male counterpart checks two of the boxes. Oh yeah, I can do that. Right. And it's the same attitude that we need to be able to do. Yeah, you can do it because you're going to learn it along the way and you have to put your mind to do it. And so as women, whether we have three of five, four or five, two of five, if it's something that you're passionate about, you have to go after it. You may not get it, but you'll learn along the way what you need to do to keep elevating yourself to inch yourself closer to you know, attaining that goal, whatever it is. And so we talk about it as job interviews, but it's in anything that we do. 
And I think we have to be a little more confident in how we approach our setting. The same thing of sitting at the table, being at the board table or a meeting table. Too often we may sit back and not really kind of voice our opinions or we'll sheepishly, sheepishly raise our hand, start to speak. And if I'm not speaking with confidence, someone else is going to cut me off, go down a different path, but someone else was listening to what I said and actually added value and will come back and say, oh yeah, they'll say it in their way. Right. But I've got to rely on you, David, to say, you know what, Tom? Yeah, you know, Kat was just touching on that. So, you know, why don't you let her finish her thought before she was interrupted earlier? And, and that happened. So we have to have allies in the room. Um, we have to have our male allies in the room that are, are really recognizing that, yes, we add value and that, yes, our voice matters. And yes, our opinions are brilliant um, to, to be able to move forward. And, and I think for the, the women that are on this webinar, you know, be a little, little more confident or, or, or maybe go back around. If, if you don't have a male counterpart that's going to speak up for you, then you interrupt Tom and say, Tom, yeah, thanks for bringing that back up. So as I was saying, you have to be able to own your voice with confidence to put yourself out there to show that you do have those leadership capabilities. Right. I also think it takes a, a confident and strong leader to delegate. And delegating was a consistent theme in many of the decision-making examples that you provided. Um, I, know, I know you feel strong about delegating the team that you have. Can you talk about how you delegated and, and how you use that um, to, as a leader of the USTA to get a lot of important things done? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's important. We did, listen, no one knows everything. Um, and I know what I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a theme of mine. I know what I don't know. And, and I have to rely on those experts that do know. But in that process, I'm trying to learn more about those areas. And, and once I feel comfortable in, in making certain decisions, I know that it's not my direction that I should carry something forward. Whereas it may be for you, David, where that's your level of expertise. David, you need to handle this or you go down this path et cetera. Um, I've not only done it with the USA, but I do, I do it in everything that I do. And it's, and it's really, what it does is it empowers your, your staff to believe in themselves more because you have the confidence in them to carry something out as opposed to me taking their knowledge or their words and me trying to spin them as if I'm the one that came up with certain ideas, et cetera. I probably didn't lean on my board members enough um, as I reflect and look back, but it is something that I learned walking out of that. Um, so as I move forward in other, other industries, um, I have that capability and awareness to know that, you know, I can't do this alone. It's not about me. It's really about all of us. And I, a few more questions are going to come from me and then, then a couple of uh, questions from our audience. Um, I like your story about Justin. Uh, participant at the, the Harlem program. To me, it showed how leadership could also be personal. You changed his life by showing him that you cared. Um, there are many facets of leadership, aren't there? No, absolutely. I mean, you know, this is, this right here, the ear, I think is the biggest facet of, of being a good leader um, and being a good listener. And, and so, you know, when I'm dealing with some of the youth in, in our program, and we've had some some amazing stories um, of kids overcoming certain things, but feeling that they could actually come in the office and, and just pour their hearts out and having parents coming in to pour their hearts out um, really says a lot about how they look at you or look at me um, and, and their trust that they have. And so it's my responsibility and my duty to make sure that we are providing that space and that ear for these young people so that they can build that confidence and that self-esteem that, that they're lacking and to, and to give them hope. And, and that young man is a senior at, you know, in college and, and will soon be going on to medical school. So you know, it's, it's those stories that tug along at your heart and, and, and those are the stories as to why I'm still involved you know, at the Hardin Junior Tennis and Education Program. I know your parents were instrumental in your success as a player and a leader. 
What advice would you give to those kids who don't have the positive role models at home uh, like you did? Yeah, it's true. It's uh, too many of our kids don't have um, the positive role models or at least the two parents at home. So it's important on the, it's important for these young, young kids to, you know, find a mentor that they can latch on to, whether it's another family member, a teacher, a coach, et cetera, that can help build their self-esteem. Um, it's important for them to have their own dreams and, and try to make a plan. It's hard to know how to make a plan if you don't have someone there teaching you as to what that is. But you know, the most important thing is that for these kids, particularly in our programs, that's why our programs are so successful because we have coaches and mentors that are part of them that are helping to, to uplift these kids and, and put them on the right track. You've said that you feel a responsibility to make things better for those who come after you. Uh, is that what motivates you? It, it does motivate me because, you know, if I have to work twice as hard, I only want the person behind me to, to have to work hard. Um, but, you know, we know that the person behind you is going to work twice as hard than you do because <laughs> of evolution and, and things are, are evolving on, on a daily basis. Um, and so part of that motivation is, is someone put their, put their hand out to me to pull me forward. And it's my responsibility to put that hand out to pull somebody behind me. And whether it's a child, whether it's a colleague, whether it's a coach, whether it's you know some random person that sends me an email, I get emails from people all over the world that I don't know, um, you know, to ask me questions, to ask, asking me to be their mentor or give them some direction, et cetera. That is what keeps me going because it means that I'm doing something right and that people are taking notice of what I'm doing and, and that I'm being successful in that path. Yep. And uh, I know you, you had a lot of positive role models and, and it's just proof uh, of what can happen with somebody when they're, they're, they have the right guidance. Um, Michael, I'm gonna go to you. I know there are some questions uh, from the audience. So uh, go ahead, let's, let's hear one. Yeah, great. Thanks, uh, thanks for that. Yeah, we've gotten a few, a few questions so far. Um, Katrina, one of them, this, this came um, ju just a second ago, but I think this is great. Um, in what ways does the sport of tennis need to continue to fight against sexism? And how can we use tennis's success in matters like equal pay um, to transform the workplace? Yeah, I mean, tennis is, we have the best opportunity to continue to fight for equality because we've, we have succeeded in some areas um, and not in, in many other areas. The succession or where, we've, where we have succeeded is with equal prize, at least in the grand slams at the highest levels, et cetera. But we're still owning 21% of women coaches. Um, that's globally. And I believe it's just a 17% or 21% here in, in America as well. And so we have to provide these opportunities for our women to get in these roles, to be coaches, to be in the boardroom, to be, you know, the teachers that we need them to be or that we're capable of being so that we are role models for the next generation. You know, we're a lot of, we have a lot of great female players that are coming out of juniors, going into college and playing, but when they leave the sport, then they leave our business and we need to find a way to lure them back into the business side of our sport with their expertise so that they can be those leaders going forward. But for our, our kids, you know, give them, give them a racket, give them that opportunity and, and, and really promote just how great they are or can be and what opportunities lie ahead. Something else that, that came across here, um... You, you're, you're an author now, you wrote a book, um, you've, you've had your hands in, in a lot of things over the years, but after writing and completing this, this book, what did you learn most about that process um, in, in just going from start to finish with something like that? Yeah, well, it was challenging, I can tell you that. Um, this book was actually written in 2019. It was due to release in, 20, in July of 2020. So I actually turned a manuscript in in mid-January uh, of 2020. And um, lo and behold, the pandemic came, you know, just two months later, and then it got pushed um, a year later. But 
I would say in writing it, just going through the process and, and reflecting um, was good and bad as far as, you know, you start to go into Pandora's box and, 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 and pull out feelings that you didn't really know that you had that may have been, that were tucked away or swept under the rug. And it allowed me to really start to talk about them. Um, so that was the good and the bad of that. But also, you know, what happened and transpired in 2020, um, had I written the book in 2020 or gone back and, and re-edited it, it might've been a completely different tone of voice. So I learned a lot about myself in that process. I learned a lot about um, how grateful I am for the road that I've traveled and for the people that were on that road with me. Because the one thing that I do throughout the book is I credit others because I know I didn't get to where I got alone and I know wherever I'm going next, I'm not getting there alone. And it's important for people to recognize those that have lifted them up and that have nudged them to push them forward. Um, because I think that also are, is a great trait of understanding what a true leader is when you're constantly, you know, bringing others forward with you. Katrina, you, you probably went into the book thinking, all right, when it's done in your head, you probably thought this is what the reaction to the book is going to be. And this is what the book tour is going to be like. And then, then it all happened. How, how did it, how did it actually happen compared to what you were sort of envisioning in your mind? Well, it's completely different, obviously. Um, you know, I think you have the momentum of, of, finishing the book and thinking you're about to go out on tour. And then obviously um, nothing, you know, and then yeah, the book right. is delayed a year later. So, you know, supposed to release the, the Monday, second Monday of Wimbledon, you know, on air at ESPN. And, and then I would have started the book tour from the U.S. Open series through the U.S. Open last year, um, et cetera, and all the conferences that I would normally attend. And, you know, I would have sold 40,000 books by now, but, <laughs> um, but, you know, here we are and, um, you know, doing a lot of virtual events, the virtual talks don't necessarily equate to book sales. People say they're going to buy the books and they don't. So trying to rely on organizations and thank you, USA middle States for contributing to that factor. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm missing out on a lot of, a lot of those opportunities from a book sale perspective, which really tells my story um, right. more in depth and, um, and create other opportunities for myself. And, and I will say before we get to Michael, I know there's a couple questions before we go. Um, for those who haven't read the book, I gotta say it's, you know, it's, it's a leadership book, but it's, it's a personal journey book. But if all the people listening today are, we're tennis people, we're USTA tennis people. And there's a lot of really interesting stories about how things went down um, in, in, a, in a few different circumstances, which, you know, we, we didn't really know the details of in, until you read your book. And that's, that's really interesting to read. So I'd, I'd encourage those folks to, uh, to get the book. Um, all right, Michael, next question. Yeah, I got, I got two more we want to get to here before we let you go, Katrina. Um, but one kind of alludes to what you, you just talked about it, with the current state of, you know, some opportunities you've had and whatnot. But the last few weeks, the last few months, we've we've seen your name a lot more and more, um, a lot of interviews, a lot of press. Can you just talk for a minute about what a day in the life has been like the, since the book came out and, and the sort of stuff you've been doing um, you know, throughout that journey? Yeah, no, it's been fun, but it's been busy. Uh, I've been very fortunate. Um, my, my publishing company did a great job as far as uh, getting a lot of media opportunities for me. The book was released on Good Morning America on February 23rd, and I've had uh, other national um, shows with PBS and uh, WGN TV. Uh, I've done a ton of podcasts in, in the last couple of months, so my, uh, my calendar has been a lot busier uh, lately than, than it normally would be, but it's been good. And I think every, you know, even these conversations, I actually... I'm learning more and more about myself along the way because there's always a question that's asked differently that makes me think about something differently. So I've enjoyed it. I think it's, an, it's also been an opportunity to, in particular, to talk about tennis more to people who may not be thinking about it or to uh, re-energizing a lot of tennis players who haven't been playing because they've heard my story or they've seen the pod, they've heard the podcast or they've seen something on social media, um, et cetera. And, but in addition, it's also 
allowing people outside of the tennis world to know more about me, um, know more about my background, more about my passions and, and my abilities um, to be a leader. Great, and then um, one more I wanna to get to here. Uh, I, I feel like this is the kind of thing that we could probably keep you for, for a few hours, um, <laughs> but we're not gonna do that to you. Um, but this is kind of going back a, a little bit to something you talked about earlier about delegating and balancing time. And certainly seems like you've got a lot going on now um, and going back to some of your previous roles, but can you just talk about the, um, the balancing of, you know, how hard sometimes it can be to, to give things up or to ask for help, um, and to really start to delegate and maybe what somebody who struggles with that, what's, what could you, uh, advice could you offer to them to maybe make some progress? Yeah, it's something that I continue to struggle with on a daily basis um, because right now it's just me. I don't have an assistant. I don't have anyone that, that's really pulling a lot of this stuff together. And and for me, it's hard to say no. Um, and, and literally just in the last week, I've actually had to decline a couple of things because it's just too much for me. It's too much for me because I can't focus on the thing that actually, um, you know, on the thing that pays, pays my bills. <laughs> so I've got to make sure that I you know, delegate the right amount of um, time to my program um, in addition to, to the book. You know, I think the book is helping promote the program in, in a sense. And, and so it's making sure that you, first of all, know how to say no when, when the time is appropriate, but also to be able to ask for, for help. And I mean, I think for me and what I'm doing right now, uh, the assistance comes from you know, I actually brought on someone to do the social media for me as opposed to me trying to do it. You can't keep up with social media because it's really, a, it's a 24 seven job if you're gonna do it right. Um, you know, I've got colleagues at, at my program that, that I trust to be able to, to hold down the fort when I'm not there, et cetera. But having a schedule for yourself and understanding where your energy lies because you have to make time for yourself and if you're, cause if you're not rested, you can't be productive the next day. So that delegation goes off to a colleague, um, maybe to a junior colleague, if depending on what it is, but in order to keep that energy up here and, and high energy and to keep your, your, your eye on the tiger, um, you have to understand how to say no and start to minimize, or I don't wanna say minimize, but make sure you have different lanes and know which lane you're in based on all the projects that you may be involved with. All right, Michael, thank you for, for monitoring the questions and, and that is all the time we have today. Thank you to everyone joining us online. A reminder to our USTA Middle States volunteers that we'll soon announce our next leadership series event. So please stay tuned for that. And if you're taking notes, but missed something today, look for an email in the next few days from USTA Middle States that will contain a link with the audio and video from this conversation. Katrina, thank you for your time today, for your leadership lessons and for inspiring us all. We can't wait to see what comes next for you. Thanks, David, and thank you, USTA Middle States. Appreciate right. it. Bye, everybody.